everybody. It's Dr. Eric Ball Cabbage. We're back for another edition of Thyroid Answers Podcast. And today we've got another guest. We have Dr. Sarah Myhill today. And Dr. Sarah Myhill is not from the US. She's from the other side of the pond, but we brought her in today. It's probably a little bit later. She's maybe ready for, for afternoon tea or something, but we're going to talk about thyroid physiology as usual. Uh, I'm familiar with, uh, with uh, Sarah's work because when I was digging into physiology, this was a person who was talking about the mitochondria and talking about it differently than maybe other people were talking about it. And I think this is a topic that she and I may have a little discussion about a little bit later because I think it's really important. And my thoughts and theories on thyroid physiology and what's going on um, ties a lot to some of her own work on thyroid physiology, on, on mitochondrial physiology. So uh, we're going to introduce her now. Sarah, how are you? How are you doing today? Fine. Thank you, Eric. I've had a lovely day so far with some good clinical work this morning, and I look forward to going out and digging my garden this afternoon. So I appreciate you coming on the podcast. You got a new book coming that's coming out or it's coming out soon, right? No, it's, it's available now. Okay. So you've got a new book out. The book is called The Underactive Thyroid. And so we're going to talk about that and we'll have a discussion about two different things. I know Craig uh, Robinson, he reached out to me at some point about coming on the podcast. So it was interesting that you guys... Uh, working together. I didn't know that you guys were working together. I started reading the book and I was like, oh, I think I know that name from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it, so you've put out a number of books, but do me a favor, just tell everybody who Sarah My Hill is. I mean, there's there's maybe a few people who don't know who you are. So why don't you explain who you are and then we'll talk about the book and, and some of your other work. Okay. Well, I'm a conventionally trained doctor and I qualified um, in medicine in 1981. I then worked for 20 years in the British National Health Service as a conventional GP. And during that time as I was working, I became increasingly aware that modern conventional uh, medicine is not looking for disease causation. It is not asking the question why. It's all about symptom, symptom suppression with drugs. So blood pressure is treated with drugs to reduce the blood pressure instead of asking the question, why does this person have high blood pressure? You know, ditto arthritis. Arthritis is tre treated with painkillers instead of asking the question why. And during those 20 years, I became increasingly disillusioned with what I was doing um, in, um, uh, in, in conventional medicine in this country. And the single biggest group of people who were consulting me were people who were fatigued. They were tired all the time. In fact, in the 1980s, in general practice in this country, that complaint of TATT, -T, tired all the time, afflicted, uh, um, involved about 40% of all GP con consultations. It's a very common tr problem. It is also extremely badly treated. Now, I didn't know the answers then, and I can assure you I don't know all the answers now, but if you ask the right questions, the right answers pop up. And um, um, I was starting to uh, get uh, engaged with these patients, you know, uh, um, uh, increasingly so. And by 2000, the year 2000, I realized I didn't have the clinical freedoms that I needed in NHS practice to be an effective doctor. And at that point, I left the NHS. I set up as an independent GP specializing in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And of course, thyroid is centrally important in treating patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So that's what I've got here. Okay. So I would agree. Thyroid physiology is a huge issue. Why do you think it's such a big issue? And do you think it's bigger than the 10% that it, we're often told that it's about 10% of the population struggle with hypothyroidism? Oh, absolutely. Much more common. My guess in the fatigue syndrome uh, population, my guess is at least 50%. In the general population, my guess is it's at least 20 or maybe 30 percent. And the single reason why it is so underdiagnosed is, well, is because doctors adjust the dose of thyroid hormones according to the TSH. And if a TSH is normal, the patients are told there's nothing wrong with your thyroid, go away. And by diagnosing the underactive thyroid in that fashion and treating it so, uh, many people do not get a proper diagnosis or they are undertreated. Okay. So when we're thinking about thyroid physiology, I think one of the challenges that occurs 
is that we're only thinking about the thyroid gland and we're missing the rest of the story. There was a, there's a guy, I forget what his name was. He used to do the Sunday morning and now the rest of the story, right? So he would tell the story that everybody knew and then he would tell the rest of the story. And so I think what happens in thyroid physiology, we tell the story of the gland that's become dysfunctional, but we forget the rest of the story. And so I understand the angst and anger towards kind of allopathic medicine to some degree. Like what, why would you not look at the rest of the picture And then when I wrote my book, The Thyroid Debacle, I realized, man, I'm really angry. And I need to, what I should be trying to do is build the bridge. This is what physicians are taught. While I don't agree with it, it just means that that's what they do. And there's people that don't want to do what maybe I want them to do to get healthy. And we need that. But for the people that do want to get healthy and don't want to be on a lifetime of medication, we need to give them another opportunity. So I think allopathic medicine as a, as a general goal doesn't do a great job. I totally agree with that. Um, and I think the numbers are probably higher of people who have what I call cellular or tissue hypothyroidism are much greater than the number of people who have glandular problems because we see obesity is about 50% of the U S population, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. We see all of these systems and conditions that people are developing and at the root of all of those is downregulated metabolism downregulated mitochondrial function now the argument is is that broken physiology or adaptive physiology and we can talk about that later but i think the numbers are actually higher the literature says that by the time somebody gets diagnosed as primary hypothyroidism they've lost probably greater than 90% of the function of the gland so when you're getting diagnosed that's not the beginning of a condition. That's like saying your heart attack that you just had, that's when you started getting cardiovascular disease, right? Yeah, I'm sure that's right. And and and, and you're, you're quite right about that. But uh, you know, I always approach my patients in a holistic way. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a certain order in which we have to do things. So I would never see a new patient and say, you're underactive thyroid, we start off with the thyroid. Mm-hmm. There is a, a, a process to go through. And the, the The elephant in the room, the condition that probably 90% of Westerners uh, are suffering from is metabolic syndrome, which is the condition that is driven by Western diets. And Western diets are abnormal because they're high in carbohydrates, they're low in fat, um, they're deficient in micronutrients, they're low in fiber, and uh, they're necessarily polluted. And Within those strands, there are many reasons why one could be underactive with a thyroid. So my starting point to treat every single patient who comes through my door always starts off with diet. And uh, and then we move on from there. So, of course, people come to see me because they have fatigue syndromes. They don't have the energy. And um, the reason for that is either because they've got poor energy delivery mechanisms or because, as I call it, they have a hole in their energy bucket. They've got an immunological hole in their energy bucket because they have allergies, they have autoimmunity, or they have chronic infections. And I always start with energy delivery mechanisms. And the analogy that I like to use to explain this to my patients is the car analogy. So for your car to go, there are four important players. You've got to have the right fuel in the tank. And that's all about diet and gut function. You then have to have the mitochondrial engine, which takes that fuel and um, burns it in the presence of oxygen to generate energy. And then you have to have the control mechanisms, the thyroid accelerator pedal and the adrenal gearbox. Now, the point here is that one of the main functions, one of the main ways in which thyroid hormone functions is through their action on mitochondria. And they act on mitochondria in two ways. First of all, they determine how fast mitochondria go. And secondly, they determine the number of mitochondria. And of course, if you've got a lot of mitochondria, you've got a big engine. And if you've got a few mitochondria, then you've got a little engine. The point here being is that you can't expect the thyroid hormones to manifest until you sort out the mitochondria. And you can't expect the mitochondria to function well until they've got the right fuel in the tank together with the raw materials to work together with the freedom of toxic stress for them to function. So i.e. the mitochondria have to be in a fit state to respond. 
Okay, so, so let's let's can... let, let's break that down a little bit. Okay. Okay. So for the listener, we've got you got cells. Cells have a whole bunch of different parts in them. One of the parts that drives most of the energy production is these things called your mitochondria. You bring food, yeah. you eat food. That food energy has to be converted into cellular energy. And where we do most of that most efficiently is inside the mitochondria. And that's an aerobic process. It requires oxygen, iron regulation, all these things that are important. But T th thyroid hormone, T3, primarily, T2 to a small to a degree can do it as kind of a backup source. But T3 is the big driver of that. So when you're getting your blood work done, your doctor's looking at TSH and free T4, they're kind of missing the rest of the story, right? So yeah. your body brings thyroid hormone into a cell. Your, your thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone, primarily T4, dumps it into the bloodstream. It gets driven around the bloodstream in the bus called a thyroid binding globulin. And then it has to become free of the bus to get into the cell. And it gets to the cell, it's got to get transported in. It knocks on a door, walks through the doorway, and it gets into the cell. Then the cell says, okay, T4, what do we want to do with you? T3, what do we want to do with you? And that T4 or T3 can either be, T3 could be sent to the, to the nucleus, it could be sent to the mitochondria, or T4, or, or that T3 can be what we call de metabolized or, de or deactivated. Well, it's just, they're not quite the same, but for simple purposes. And the same thing with T4. Do we want you to be converted to T3 and kind of, support the manufacturing processes of the cell, or do we want to deactivate that T4 to reverse T3 and slow down the manufacturing processes? And so once T3 binds to the receptors, that machinery can start turning on and we start manufacturing, we make energy and hormones and proteins and peptides and all this kind of great stuff. And that some of that T3 also turns down other processes in the cells. It kind of turns them off, right? Would you agree with all that stuff? Yep. Perfect. That fits in. Perfect. And so now we've got this cell, right? And we're talking about these mitochondria. What determines, from your perspective, what's determining mitochondria, whether the mitochondria is in full go mode or it's in down regulation mode? Well, uh, my, uh, uh, for mitochondria to work, you first of all, you need the raw materials to allow them to work. Mm -hmm. And um, those, um, I mean, as you're probably aware, I published papers on this and uh, we between I did work with Dr. John McLaren and Howard, who did who developed mitochondrial function tests mm -hmm. and the, the common five rate limiting step deficiencies that come up time and time and time again are magnesium, CoQ10, vitamin B3, acetyl L-carnitine and D-ribose. Now, I'm no, I don't say they're the only things, but they're the, the top of the list priorities. And if you if you are lacking in any one of those raw materials, then your mitochondria will not have the raw materials to function normally. Normally, they will go slow okay. and then and then of course mitochondria can go slow because of reactive oxygen species as you're aware now if you pass sugar through mitochondria to generate energy you produce a lot of reactive oxygen species or free radicals if you pass ketones through mitochondria to generate energy very few reactive oxygen species so the fuel in the tank itself will have a direct impact on mitochondrial function and guess what i want my mitochondria to run with the least friction the most easily and so do all my patients and therefore i recommend recommend a ketogenic diet. So we are primarily fueling our mitochondria with ketones. Okay. But is there a possibility? So there's work, are you familiar with Dr. Robert Navio's work? Absolutely. Cell danger response. Yes. Okay. So where do you see the cell danger response playing into this whole picture? Well, I, well, you know, I don't know for sure. Remember, I'm a clinician. I'm not a biochemist. So I don't hypothesize biochemistry. I put into clinical practice what I know works and works for my patients. And I think what happens to the cell danger response is it's, a, it's almost a learned response. The um, mitochondria are so um, assailed by a combination of factors, which might be deficiencies, it might be chronic infections, it might be reactive oxygen species, that they go into hibernation mode, they go into shutdown mode. And when they're in shutdown mode, it's very difficult to know how, how to reactivate them. So I have many patients who do my regimes to perfection, <clears throat> they do the diet beautifully, 
They sort out their mitochondrial package. They do the detox regime. They get up to speed with the thyroid and the adrenal hormones. We sort out chronic infections and they're still in shutdown mode. And, you know, I'm not quite sure what's necessary to jumpstart those mitochondria as if to say to them, look, it's safe for you to function again. It's safe for you to um, start restoring, you know, going back to normal energy delivery mechanisms. Maybe it's a psychological factor. I don't know. But I am aware of his work. I think it's a fabulous explanation of what's going wrong. But clinically, we don't have all the answers to that. We have some of them, but not all. Oh. I would agree. We don't have all the alls, right? I would say from my perspective, when I read Navio's work, I was like, okay, this kind of makes sense from what I've been thinking about, because I don't think that this downregulation of thyroid physiology is often broken physiology. I think it's a bad place to put our patients in. I look at it more as an adaptive change. So if I'm a cell, I either want to be in manufacturing or defense mode, right? One or the other, just like I'm a person, right? I'm either out making money I'm bringing in food yeah. or yeah. I'm protecting my family. Yeah. So my mitochondria, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're, you're the mitochondrial guru. So, but a mitochondria has sensors to be able to determine changes in energy flux, right? And so if the mitochondria is sensing energy change, the cell, it triggers that cell danger physiology. Navio goes through those eight points, right? Here's the things that happen as part of that kind of danger physiology. For the listener, it's like, oh, somebody's trying to break, somebody's breaking into homes. I'm going to lock the doors. I'm locking the windows, right? We do all these things to prepare. Cells kind of do a similar thing. If yep. I'm a cell perceiving danger, one of the things I need to do is I need to lock the doors and windows. So I'm going to stiffen those cell membranes. And guess what? Yep, go ahead. But, but you're describing mechanisms, and I'm interested in the underlying reasons. Why are these mitochondria shut oh, down? Oh, I think we're we're both on the same page, okay. right? So what is the thing? So we'll talk about that in a second. But I think this down regulation of thyroid physiology that we see in the cell that causes somebody to be feel hypothyroid signs and symptoms when their gland is working and there's enough T4, T3 in the bloodstream mm -hmm. is oftentimes not broken physiology, but I'm a cell feeling a threat from a toxin, a, a thought, a trauma, an organism, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I need to do is I need to slow down the manufacturing and ramp up defense. And one of the mm -hmm. ways that we can do that is by reducing the amount of T3 inside the cell. In your world of mitochondrial function, right? The mitochondria does make exhaust. And I like the idea of what you're saying, but hey, if we're ketogenic, we make less exhaust. We do have a built-in yes. system for that, right? Yes, yes. So the built-in system, do we, we have glutathione, which is that kind of major antioxidant, right? Well, we have we have whole um, uh, we have the, the antioxidant system is is um, very fluid, and obviously we can mop up free radicals in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But basically, we have what I call frontline free radicals like mm -hmm. superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, coenzyme Q10 that mop up these electrons in the front line. Then we have, as I call it, second line antioxidants like melatonin, vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin E, all these then uh, grab an electron, let's say, from the front line uh, antioxidants and then pass it back to the ultimate repository, which is vitamin C. And vitamin C is um, the, I think that's the commonest deficiency when we're talking about antioxidant defenses. And the reason for that is humans can't synthesize it themselves. All other mammals can make their own vitamin C and can make as much as is, as is needed. So, for example, you know, during a stress, a goat can generate up to 15,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day from sugar within its metabolism. Humans can't do that. We cannot synthesize our own vitamin C. We have to consume it. And the fact of the matter is we cannot get sufficient vitamin C for optimum biochemistry just from foods alone. It's just not possible. And for, for, our, for our bodies to function optimally, um, with age and with stress, we need at least five grams of vitamin C daily. That's about 5,000 milligrams. And my guess is that that is the, probably the commonest deficiency um, that we see with respect to mopping up these free radicals. So why do you think we can't get it from our food? Is it just because of our dietary choices? It's just not, it's just very, you'd have to eat an enormous amount of food in order to, to get that amount of vitamin C. Well, do you, so, so to me, that's a struggle, right? Because why would we build, why would the 
why would we have this organism that survived for hundreds and hundreds of years that requires supplemental vitamin C when supplemental vitamin C never existed? Because um, we have sufficient vitamin C to get ourselves to child rearing age, but we don't have sufficient vitamin C beyond child rearing age to see us into a, a long and healthy old age. And the reason that this this um, um, uh, gene uh, evolved, or that which stopped us um, making vitamin C, is because by doing that, it had another evolutionary advantage, which is it switched on uh, the laying down of fat, and that allowed us to survive winters. So this probably problem probably arose about 65 million years ago when humans moved from Africa, they went out of Africa into um, um, Europe and, 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 the, and the north, where um, they then had the problem of surviving the winter. And to survive the winter, um, we would take humans would take advantage of um, the autumn windfall of free food of fruits of nuts of seeds of berries. And we would eat those foods in an addictive way and we would get fat. And what helped us to get fat was um, um, loss of our ability to make vitamin C. It switches into a fat burning mode, very similar to uric acid. There's a parallel here with uric acid. Um, uric, we lost the ability to make uric acid to um, metabolize fructose efficiently about 15 um, million years ago. And that again, put us into fat burning mode. So it is a major evolutionary disadvantage, I agree. But on the other hand, it allowed us to survive the winters more efficiently. So it's that's the evolutionary argument I have heard. Whether you buy it or not, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is it's humans, guinea pigs and um, dry nose primates that are unable to synthesize their own vitamin C. That part I agree with. I I don't know if I can kind of hang into the idea that um, we were just we're just not built to be able that we all, that we all require supplemental vitamin C. We just can't get it sufficiently. So I don't know that I totally buy into that. But we're all we're all we all have our own ignorances and biases. So we'll, <laughs> we'll move on from there. So okay. when you're looking at what's driving thyroid physiology problems you're talking you think the what are you give me the top three four things that you are dry you think are driving somebody's hypothyroidism uh probably number one is iodine deficiency uh, number two is autoimmunity um and number three is probably toxic stress and number four is probably viral assault okay so there's camps here right so number one you said iodine deficiency so there's the iodine deficiency camp. There's also a camp that says everybody's iodine toxic, which and these two things create a lot of controversy and confusion in the client. So is everybody iodine deficient? Is everybody iodine toxic? Or is the reality that it's somewhere in between? What do, where do you I think the majority of people are iodine deficient. And if you just look at the um you know the, the papers that are there, the commonest cause of mental deficiency in the world is iodine deficiency, lack of iodine. Okay, so if somebody's saying, All right, I I I maybe I'm iodine deficient, how are they to identify that and why are they iodine deficient? Well, we're iodine deficient probably because we don't eat um, a sufficient iodine containing foods. And of course, humans evolved on the east coast of Africa. Um, I've subscribed to Elaine Morgan's theory that um, at one stage, humans moved into the sea um, in response to climate change in the middle of Africa. We moved into the sea. We became semi-aquatic. And that allowed us to um, us to stand upright vertically because we were buoyed up in the water. That's why we lost our hair. That's why we keep warm with subcutaneous fat. Um, and that's why we develop nostrils that uh, allow us to go underwater without drowning. Uh, and of course, that then those humans on in that uh, semi-aquatic environment or aquatic environment would have eaten a huge amount of seafood. And you know, early. Um, camps where primitive man and primitive woman lived. There were huge dumps of shellfish, of cockles, of mussels, of whelks, and uh, because we were eating those foods in large amounts. And um, and my guess is, and of course we know iodine is very rich in those foods, and we became used to an iodine-rich 
um, physiology, if you like. And we simply don't eat that, that amount of seafood that allows us to consume that amount of iodine. I read, I read a paper, and I can't reference it off the top of my head, which is the, the Japanese diet contains about 14 milligrams of iodine a day, uh, whereas us Westerners here, probably less than one milligram is what we get in our normal daily diet. So we're deficient because our foods are deficient, and it is as simple as that. And the reason I love using iodine is it's such a safe, um, molecule. It's not stored in the body very well. It's readily excreted and it does lots of other good things as well. You know, it's essential for making oxytocin, for example, which is the, the love hormone. We use it to detoxify. It's essential for good immune function. It lines our airways and our mucous membranes. It's a frontline defense against infection. So um, I'm of the school that we are generally iodine deficient and we should all be taking two or three drops of Lugol's iodine daily. So there's camps that say, hey, if somebody's got autoimmunity, thyroid autoimmunity, TPO antibodies, that you shouldn't be taking any iodine at all. Well, I'd like to see the mechanism for that, because I've never seen anybody present me with a biologically plausible mechanism as to why iodine should switch on autoimmunity. And iodine allergy almost invariably occurs after the use of it in some medicinal intervention, for example, the use of radioactive iodine isotopes or the use of uh, radiopaque dyes for doing um, uh, uh, imaging, such as um, you know, IVPs or something like that. But um, um, so I don't buy it that uh, iodine switches on autoimmunity. I want to see the mechanism for that. So I think the, the mechanism people will tell you, if you take more iodine, you have more iodine coming into the thyroid gland, right? You've got more upregulation of TPO activity. If they already have TPO antibodies, then the TPO antibodies create more damage to the thyroid gland. Well, I'd like to see the data. I'd like to see the studies that show that because, you know, I have looked and I can't find anything that I think is biologically plausible and is convincing. And on balance, um, we are much better off, is my view, uh, taking iodine than, than avoiding. It's not just the thyroid gland that needs iodine. I mean, the breasts, for example, um, uh, have a much higher demand for iodine than the thyroid gland does. Ditto skeletal muscle, ditto the immune system, uh, ditto the brain. It's not just the, the thyroid gland that, that, that requires iodine. And to restrict iodine or take low iodine diets, you know, I just think is, a, is, is, a, is not a good idea. Well, I have a tendency to, to agree. I'm more in the middle, right? I don't think we need high dose iodine. I also don't think we need to be in fear of iodine. And I, and I don't buy into the, based on the literature I've read, you know, we, we, I, I've been doing this 29 years, right? And when I was educated, it was like these antibodies are little Pac-Men eating away the thyroid gland and I don't think that's really the way it happens. And the literature says that thyroglobulin antibodies don't cause any da damage. Um, and TPO antibodies probably cause very little damage. Um, at least in the literature, most recent literature, 2001, I think the paper was. So I don't think it's the antibodies doing all the, the damage. I think they're more the cleanup crew than they are creating most of the damage. So for, for me, for that reason, that's one of the reasons why I don't know that that's necessarily the case. But there are people that have taken iodine and They've had their, their thyroid glands have blown up. I've had patients walk in that that's been um, part of their issue. But well, I, 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 I can only think of one in about the last 20 years for whom that has been the case. I've seen a few they, because they've, they've followed a path um, of kind of that, that path and home do working on this at home was it the right strategy uh for them mm -hmm. obviously not but there probably were under other underlying factors that were going on as well. well well that's that's the point and and um you know we're looking at iodine in, in isolation the thyroid gland in isolation but i would never you know start somebody on um you know a thyroid you know interventions until i got all else in place first and it's the old story you have to do these things in a particular order you have to sort out um uh, the, the diet first and with that the upper fermenting gut and i say that because my guess is that many hormone resistant uh, clinical pictures like diabetes, for example, which is an insulin re resistance, like you're talking about thyroid hormone receptor resistance, or we're touching on that subject. My guess is that is driven by metabolic syndrome, i.e. it's either there's something about high carbohydrate, high sugar diets that cause 
hormone resistance syndromes. For example, um, um, if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, then you overwhelm the ability of the upper gut to um, um, to sterilize that, that the contents and digest it, and you end up with a fermenting upper gut. Now, if you have a fermenting upper gut, and, of course, and by upper gut, I mean stomach, duodenum, jejunum, small intestine, if that is fermenting foods instead of digesting them, then you have a whole colonies of bacteria there and fungi that are growing. You have the products of fermentation, such as alcohol, delactate, hydrogen sulfide, amino compounds and such like. And the microbes themselves have the ability to translocate and get into the bloodstream and drive pathology. So, you know, I want to be looking at those problems before we even address the thyroid issue. And, you know, yes, if I had somebody who had not done all that stuff and, and just starts on hydro, um, iodine or, you know, or other such interventions, then they're not doing it in a logical way. And you're much more likely to get side effects than if you do it in a, in a chronologically, um, uh, correct way. So the order by which, in which my patients make interventions is, is critically important. Um, just, just one example of this. If you have somebody who is on a high carbohydrate diet and has an upper fermenting gut, if you give them nutritional supplements, or if they choose to take nutritional supplements, what those supplements are going to do is they're going to feed those microbes, those yeasts and those bacteria in the upper fermenting gut, and they're going to ferment harder. And they're and, and potentially they're going to get worse. Because as you know, um, from an evolutionary perspective, mitochondria derive from bacteria. And they have and bacteria have very similar needs as to mitochondria. So if you've got a stomach full of bacteria and you and you swallow mitochondrial supplements, you're going to be feeding those microbes directly and make that upper fermentation much worse. And believe you me, the upper fermenting gut produces a lot of toxins, um, um, uh, either bacterial endotoxin, fungal mycotoxin, products of fermentation, the microbes themselves, to which one can then become uh, allergic to if they get into the bloodstream, and my guests are responsible for autoimmunity by driving molecular mimicry. So the so, so context is, is very important. We have to, say, start uh, with the with with the basic stuff, the diet, you know, uh, sorting out the upper fermenting gut, and then you can start putting in nutritional supplements to correct the mitochondria. And then, when the mitochondria are in a fit state to respond, you can then start to look, work on the thyroid and the adrenal glands. Yeah, I I agree with a large portion of that. I think what happens too often is we start trying to give more thyroid hormone to say, hey, if I just give more hormone, thyroid hormone, it'll make it work. The problem with that is. Whether you look at it from, we may have a little bit different perspectives of looking at it, but putting more thyroid hormone into a system that it can't respond, that can't respond or doesn't want it because it's deactivating what you are already getting, it's probably not a great idea. And for the listener, and you can jump, kind of finish this out. One of the challenges, Sarah talked about this before, is what is thyroid hormone? do for the mitochondria. It actually makes more mitochondria. So if I have more, if I take more thyroid hormone and I make more mitochondria, more mitochondrial density, what do I do? I have sick or unhealthy mitochondria and I just made a whole bunch more of them. That's a more toxic system that I just made. I Now I really throw off the balance. So uh, do you agree with, with that piece of it? I, I think that I, I, I don't know if you're making more mitochondria that are sicker, but what I do know is this, there's a stimulus to make more mitochondria. The body has to have the raw materials to do that. Right. Um, it has but, to have the fats, the proteins, um, uh, the, the, the CoQ10, the vitamin, you know, um, B, B3, carnitine, and all that. It needs the raw materials to make those new mitochondria. So I say it has to be in a fit state to respond before you give it the thyroid kick, whether you're making mitochondria run faster or you're generating more mitochondria. Yeah. So probably the part of the issue, too, is, is that if we look at what's going on, we say, oh, we're just efficient. Let's just take more supplementation. We can't just give more supplementation to make the mitochondria better because if we do have this cell stress response going on, we do have the cell stiffening of the membrane, transport of micronutrients across that membrane are going to be downregulated. Transport of oxygen across that membrane is downregulated. That's part of that kind of defense mechanism, whether it's correct or not. You know, I, I kind of think that that makes sense. So not only is 
when we talk about blood sugar regulation, hey, why do we have people with metabolic syndrome? Well, they probably have a cell, they may have a cell stress response. They may have down regulation of thyroid hormone. They may, thyroid hormone T3 helps regulate those glucose transporters, all of them. And so if I have, if I downregulate thyroid hormone physiology inside my cell, I'm going to have decreased glucose transport. I'm going to stack up glucose outside the cell. I'm going to make more insulin. I'm going to be insulin resistant. I'm going to develop metabolic syndrome. So is metabolic syndrome the cause or is this part, is that all the outcome, right? Well, it's both. But yeah. what we do know about metabolic syndrome is you can reverse it completely with a ketogenic diet. So that's why that is the starting point. So we're trying to reduce the load. We're trying to reduce the work of the body in as many ways as we can. And sometimes, you know, I have patients who come and see me and I really am not sure of the last bit of physiology that's making them ill. All I know is that, and, and very often these people, you know, uh, don't have sufficient money to pay for all the expensive tests that one might like to do. But we put in place these simple, safe, Okay, they're not easy to do. A ketogenic diet is not easy, but we put in place these simple, safe interventions. And it's re remarkable how many people just gradually you know, get well, because, of course, we all know the body wants to get well. And if you can give it the raw materials, the freedom from toxic stress, the freedom from infectious stress, um, um, the time, the rest, the sleep and all that, then it will heal and repair. And I'm a very simple doctor. Um, as I say, I, I, I don't pretend to know as much physiology as, as you do, but um, I like to enthuse my patients with um, the intellectual know-how, if you like, and the, you know, um, so that they will do these difficult regimes because sorting out the ketogenic diet, sorting out the upper fermenting gut, um, you know, it's difficult, it's hard work. And we're dealing with people who don't have the energy so we have to find the most, the easiest route to recovery, the most frictionless route to recovery, um, uh, and, and the most affordable route to recovery. Because of course, these people can't work; they haven't got the money to pay for expensive um, supplements. So we, I don't want to waste a, a penny of their money, and I want to get well as as, as easily and as simply as possible. I, listen, I, I agree with all those comments, right? So I think the issue, especially in, from a functional medicine standpoint, um, one of the things that happens is that we get caught up in the new shiny object. It's mold. Everybody's got mold. And then we go through the, then it's Candida, then it's Epstein-Barr, then it's this, then it's that. And everybody's looking for the shiny object that's the, the thing that's causing it. And my opinion, and I'll get your take on this, is that it's not a thing. It's the accumulation of stress over time without recovery, right? If I exercise every day, same muscle group, day in, day out, at some point, I'm breaking that muscle tissue down. I'm not recovering. It's going to break. I'm going to damage it, right? And so what happens for my opinion is for most of us is we go through life. I, I, I talk about two cinder blocks and a board going across. And we think about what goes on in life. Stress is not bad. Stress is great. It makes us physically stronger and more adaptable, resilient. But if we're all constantly stacking weights on the board and we're never pulling the weights off, at some point we exceed the capacity of the board and it's broken. And we go, Correct. oh my gosh, that last thing I put on there broke the board. No, Correct. it wasn't the last little thing you did that broke the board. It was the accumulation yeah. of the stress over time. Well, then stress is bad. No, stress is great. That's why I lift and work out. But I also have to allow for recovery. And what I see and what you were talking about is we have dietary stress. We have emotional stress. We have sleep distress. We have respiratory distress. We have all of these things that are cumulative over time, toxins, all these things. What we want is the one shiny thing that we can just take and fix it or remove and it goes away. And it's more complex than that. And what I try and get my patients to do is the same thing you do is say, hey, let's deal with the low hanging fruit stuff, dietary change, emotional fitness. What are your habits? What are your behaviors? What is your lifestyle like, right? Those are free. They're free. They don't cost anything. Eat a healthier diet, whether it's, and I, you know, ketogenic diet. Well, hey, that's a struggle. Okay, how about we eat more whole food and less processed food? How about we start there, right? Could we do that and make it, that's a good jumping point, right? So I think we're on the same page as that we have to help our patients with those pieces of it. Go ahead, you wanted to jump in. 
Well, I was gonna, all I can say is um, I don't have, you know, particular treatments for particular things. I have what I call groundhog regimes. And I call them groundhog regimes because like the film Groundhog Day, where our hero you know, is in a time loop and, and, and replays a day over and over and over again. It's because I keep coming back to these. And I have three levels of what I call groundhog. I call groundhog basic, which is what we should all be doing all the time to stay well and live to our full potential. I have groundhog acute, which is what we should be putting in the place in the event of an acute infection. And then I have groundhog chronic, which is the which is you know, all, all, all else plus more to how we deal with chronic disease, whatever that may be. And most pathology, dementia, cancer, heart disease, most of these conditions have an infectious driver. And um, uh, that is the, um, the, the elephant in the room. And, and the problem is, is when you get one infection in, that infection gets in there because the immune system has failed. It's failed to keep it at bay or it's failed to control it in the body. And if you get one infection in, then the defences are laid open and you get other infections in. And these are called co-infections. So somebody who's got chronic Epstein-Barr virus is much more likely to have Lyme as well and maybe Bartonella and maybe Borrelia and maybe yeast in, 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 as well. And you, know, you can't give everybody you know, the antibiotics, the antivirals, the antifungals to deal with those infections one at a time. What we have to do is to improve the immune system. And if the immune system is in tip top shape, then you're not going to get these infections in the first place. And if you do have a chronic infection, it's going to be the starting point to get rid of that chronic infection, you know, improve the immune system. And that is the big question that we should all be asking about this COVID-19 uh, nonsense. Not is why is COVID-19 you know, killing so many people? Well, is it? I'm not sure it is. But um, but the question is, why do some people get COVID-19 and have no symptoms whatsoever? And the answer is, it's the immune system. And guess what? Thyroid function is an essential part of that, because if you can't deliver energy efficiently to your immune system, you're going to get those infections. And once you start acquiring infections, you're on the slippery slope downhill because we know infections drive cancer. We know they drive prion disorders. Um, we know they, they drive heart disease. And many of those microbes come from the upper fermenting gut. And that's why sugar, or part of the reason why sugar is such a major risk factor for all those conditions. You know, we know dementia is being called type three um, diabetes. Uh, we know cancer cells. What makes cancer cells different from human cells is they can only run on sugar. But at the same time, sugar is feeding infections because bacteria and yeast can only run on sugar. So if you're eating carbohydrates, high carbohydrate diet, fermenting gut, you are stacking the odds against your whole immune system and your whole well-being and health. And that's why I say keep going bang on. It's it's back to the back to basics, what I call the groundhog regimes. We're giving patients packages of treatments, which is diet, sorting out the fermenting gut, supplements, detox regimes, maybe herbal preparations, sort the thyroid, thought et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's packages of treatment, not that one, you know, um, uh, cause that everybody wants, that one silver bullet they think is going to cure them. Yeah, I I think that becomes the key. I mean, it, it'd be nice if that was the case. It's not the case. And we see that even with our physiology. And again, we maybe we have the same opinion on this, maybe we don't. But we uh, what I see here, definitely here in the States, is somebody tries – they go to traditional medicine. They say, "Well, the secret recipe is t T4." Uh, they do well. Then they then they t they stabilize and they symptoms are kind of plateau. And then they get more mm -hmm. thyroid hormone and then they plateau. And then they get more thyroid hormone and then they plateau. And then they get more thyroid hormone and then they feel hyperthyroid. And so then they reduce the dose. And then somebody says, and they get frustrated. Then they go to a integrative physician, and the integrative physician says, "Oh, that that doctor's silly. They looked at T4. They didn't look at T3. You don't convert T4 to T3. So I'm going to give you T3." And they get some T3, and they feel better. And then they plateau. And then they get more T3. And then they plateau. And then they get more T3. And then they plateau. And now they're frustrated. And now we've got people saying, well, give T2. We'll give T2 too. So we'll give all of these things. And I think that strategy creates problem. It's the same thing with, hey, let's just give a, we're looking for, we're trying to jam more hormone into a system that's not ready for it or doesn't want it. And I think that's a bad strategy, whether it's allopathic or integrative or functional. And I think it sets a bad precedent. I think it creates a lot of confusion for the patient. And they, I've got 
patients now that are on high dose, that, I, that come see me who are on high dose T4 and high dose T3. And they're like, what do I need to do? You're going to have to reduce the dose. Cause you, and they're like, but I can't. I'm like, right. Cause you're a junkie. Somebody you, you're jacked up on this stuff. We have to deal with root issues and you can't be in this hyper loaded state of medication that creates a problem too. So when we think about your strategy and how we go about this, you talk about your groundhog strategy, these basic things we need to do. What's the rest of the strategy? I'm dealing with the foundational things. I'm changing my diet. I'm working on my habits, my behaviors, my lifestyle, my emotions. But what else are you, what's the rest of that step process? Um, well, um, uh, obviously to detox is very important because we live in a poisoned world. Um, now, um, I can no longer do them because the lab hasn't been working over COVID, but I used to do many tests of toxicity and I never found a normal result. We all bear a toxic load of volatile organic compounds, pesticides um, and heavy metals. Uh, and so detox regimes are very helpful. And broadly speaking, they, they fall into two categories. Um, obviously, avoid. And you know, a major source of, deto of, of toxins are toxins in the upper fermenting gut. So when you ferment, as I say, you produce alcohol, hydrogen sulfide, D-lactate, aminoacid compounds. So first of all, sort out the upper fermenting gut by doing a keto diet. But as I say, we all bear um, a, a load of pesticides. And the, and the most pernicious, of course, is glyphosate, um, which, uh, is, as you know, chemically is an organophosphate. And the business of making energy is called oxidative phosphorylation. And organophosphates inhibit oxidative phosphorylation. And if you're not eating organic diet, you will be consuming glyphosate on a daily basis. And when I did fat biopsies to measure levels of chemical in the fat, the results would come back in milligrams per kilogram. Now, milligrams per kilogram is the sort of level that you would measure a drug in the bloodstream. So we're not talking about trace amounts. We're talking about quite high levels of pesticide. So, you know, doing keeping your environment as clean as possible and eating organic is very important. But you can get rid of these nasty chemicals by heating regimes. Now, it doesn't matter what the source of heat is be, and you don't have to sweat for these regimes to be heating, uh, to be effective. So just getting warm in, say, sunshine, a hot bath, um, a sauna, far infrared, warms up the, the fat, the subcutaneous fat, boils the um, chemicals onto the, onto the lipid layer on the surface of the skin, and then you can be washed off. And roughly speaking, 50 such heating regimes will halve the total load. So, of course, levels come out exponentially. You never get down to no molecules, but 50 molecules will, will halve it, and then another, 50, I beg your pardon, 50 saunas will halve the load, and then another 50 will halve it again, another 50 will halve it again. So it comes out and uh, so exponentially. But reducing the toxic load is very important. But that won't get rid of heavy metals. Heavy metals get stuck in our tissues, in particular heart, bone, kidneys, brain. And um, I pull the, use um, chelating agents like DMSA um, in order to remove heavy metals. And again, we can measure heavy metals in the urine, but that has to be done with a dose of DMSA. If you just do a urine test, you won't see the heavy metals there. But um, the way I like people to do it is um, wake up one morning, empty the bladder, take DMSA at the rate of 15 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, collect all their urine for six hours, and then send a sample of it off to um, the lab. And that will pull out the heavy metals. And very often there's lead, arsenic, mercury there. If you've got dental amalgam fillings, you will have mercury in the system. So detoxing um, is, is really important. And, and the point about these chemicals is it's like throwing a handful of sand into a finely tuned engine. And you throw a handful of sand into your Ferrari and it's going to wear out and, and, and block you know, the engine in unexpected ways. And the same is true of mitochondria. We know they inhibit oxidative phosphorylation directly. We know they get stuck onto, a onto um, uh, mitochondrial membranes. Mitochondrial membranes, 80% are made up of translocator protein, which is responsible for grabbing ATP from within the mitochondria, flicking into the cytosol where it does its job, grabbing ADP and recycling that back into the mitochondria. And if those translocator protein molecules can't work and they work like little turbines, then you're going to impair energy delivery mechanisms. So detoxing is, 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 is very important as well. Okay, so we've got detoxification, we talk about dietary changes, we talk about 
some yeah. of your core groundhog type yeah. supplementation. Yeah. What else is missing? Oh gosh, um, that that covers a lot. I can assure you. Um, so we uh, talked about you talked about adrenal stuff. So here's, yeah. I guess, this is people talk about adrenal fatigue, and you got to you hear this analogy that you have to fix the adrenals before you can fix the thyroid physiology. So tell me what your thoughts are, since you're talking that. about that's part of your strategy. Part of that is helping the adrenals. So what's the strategy yeah. there? Okay, well, the strategy for the adrenal gland is not as clear cut as the thyroid gland. It's much more trial and error. Um, uh, now, the adrenal gland produces basically three groups of hormones, I think about it. Uh, they're all stress hormones. So we have adrenaline, which allows us to deal with stress from seconds to minute. So if a saber tooth tiger drops, you know, jumps out of me in the jungle, you know, I have an adrenal hit within seconds. Um, that stress is then taken over by um cortisol which is the minutes to hours stress response and then that is followed by a DHEA which is the longer stress response and that's where an adrenal stress profile can be helpful and um, it's an easy test to do saliva test only costs about 70 pounds so it's, it's inexpensive and it gives you a good idea on what your adrenals are doing now the point here is that if your cortisol levels are spiking through the day we can infer from that that adrenaline has spiked i.e. you are in a stressed state. And the commonest cause of stress are wobbly blood sugar levels. And one of the good things about doing the ketogenic diet is you iron out blood sugar levels, you iron out the hormone response to that, and that gives the adrenal gland a rest. So explain to people what that means, that you have wobbly blood sugar levels. Is the blood sugar causing that, or is the fact that they aren't they don't have optimal mitochondrial function is that they're generating more I, glucose to to drive yeah. the system i think it no no i think it's primarily dietary driven and if you're eating um a carbohydrate based diet with fruit bread pasta potato you know what carbohydrates are <laughs> um um if you if you if you're eating those carbohydrates on a regular basis three times a day for example and you're never fasting then you saturate the normal method for mopping up those blood sugar hikes you see, when we eat food, it gets digested in the gut and all starches are broken down into simple sugars. Now, those simple sugars um, don't get into the systemic bloodstream. They get into the portal vein. That's the, the, the blood drainage of the gut. And that portal vein goes straight to the liver. Mm -hmm. And the liver is there to sort out this toxic soup that comes through from the gut, which will include Blood sugars up and down, depending when you had your last meal, um, 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 proteinaceous compounds coming through, bacterial um, uh, endotoxin, fungal mycotoxins and so on. So the liver does a fantastic job. And the most important thing it has to do is, is stop that blood sugar that's fl flooding through from the portal vein, getting immediately into the systemic bloodstream. And the reason for that is sugar is extremely dangerous stuff. It's sticky. It sticks to things. It sticks to proteins and twists them, uh, maybe into prion proteins. It sticks to the lining of blood vessels and damages them. It sticks to hemoglobin, and that's how we can measure average blood sugar levels by looking at a glycosylated hemoglobin. And as we said, it drives cancer. So the blood sugar levels need to be kept within very tight ranges. And the first mechanism by which the liver does that is with what I call the glycogen sponge. So um, uh, we can, the liver can mop up so much sugar in, in the liver as glycogen where it is stored. And then as blood sugar levels drop, then it's squeezed dry and, um, and sugar is eked out, you know, drip by drip in from the liver into the bloodstream according to demand. And there's also a certain amount of glycogen in muscle. But the problem is, is when we're eating high carbohydrate diets and we are constantly pushing sugar into the system, you saturate the glycogen sponge. It can no longer mop up all that sugar that's coming through because it's saturated. And at that point, it gets into the bloodstream and triggers an insulin response. Now, insulin brings the blood sugar down by shunting into fat. It might dump that fat in the liver, and that's why we're seeing epidemics of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, um, it, but it, it, and it'll dump fat as subcutaneous fat. And that's why we're seeing epidemics of obesity, because that's how the body gets rid of sugar. Um, and um, but what that means is instead of having nice level um, uh, 
levels of blood sugar, um, it's fluctuating. The, the liver can't control it because the glycogen sponge is saturated. And so the blood sugar levels start to wobble. And what's so interesting about the blood sugar is the hormone response to it is not related to the actual level of sugar in the blood, but to the rate of change. So if the blood sugar increases very quickly, then you will get a large insulin response. And the way to increase your blood sugar very quickly indeed is to drink a pint of beer very quickly because beer is high in sugar. It's also got a high glycemic index in its own right because of the grains that are in there. And the alcohol means that the sugar is absorbed very rapidly and you will get a very rapid increase in blood sugar, which partly explains the addictive nature of beer. And as the blood sugar goes up very quickly, you get an insulin response. And it's a very big insulin response because, as I say, the blood sugar is coming up rapidly. And if you get a very big insulin response, then the blood sugar will come down very rapidly. And as the blood sugar is dropping rapidly, um, the brain panics it, because it thinks it's something has run out of fuel because blood sugar is coming down very rapidly. And it responds by producing adrenaline. And so the people who are who have are on what I call the blood sugar roller coaster will be alternately spiking insulin and then adrenaline and then insulin and then adrenaline. And eventually you get insulin depend, uh, insulin resistant diabetes and you get adrenal fatigue for the same reason, because you're spiking adrenaline and exhausting the adrenal glands. So in my clinical practice, the commonest reason for high cortisol levels is sugars and carbohydrates and probably other addictions too for the same reason. Now, the reason we use addictions is to deal with stress. Uh, so stress and addiction go together. I mean, when I was being you know, um, uh, prosecuted by the General Medical Council, you know, my alcohol consumption went up considerably because that was the only window of time in the day that you know, I, I had that momentary freedom from that stress. Uh, and people deal with stress with addiction. It might be nicotine, it might be cannabis, but for many people, it's sugar. We know that sugars and fast carbohydrates give us a short sense of you know, relaxation. We call it comfort eating. In this country, it's um, a chip butty, which is chips between two slices of white bread. In Scotland, it's a sugar sandwich. So everybody has their own um, particular carbohydrate that they go for. But stress and addiction are two sides of the same coin, and both of them have the effect of exhausting the adrenal glands. So let's talk about that a little bit because the, we hear this kind of the, this conversation, adrenal fatigue, like the adre adrenal gland fatigues. And there's a camp that says that happens. There's another camp that says that doesn't happen. So where, where do you stand on the whole okay. concept of adrenal fatigue and why do we think it, it fatigues if it does? Well, it fatigues because the, it, it's, it cannot keep up with demand. And if the constant demand is for adrenaline, 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 cortisol, of course, to deal with stress, then eventually it simply won't be able to put out the adrenal hormones that it needs, that we need to deal with that stress. And or the mitochondria are simply not in a fit state to respond because they lack the energy, they lack the fuel, or they lack the raw materials, or they are blocked. So it's a two pronged thing. So that's why we have to deal with the whole thing in a holistic way, not just do the adrenals, just do the thyroid. Just it's the whole shooting match because they're all interrelated. You can't quit, pull them apart. But you know the but we un, of course we have adrenal fatigue. I mean, um, um, you know the doctors recognise the only adrenal fatigue they recognise is Addison's disease, where there's complete destruction of the adrenal glands and no adrenal hormone production you know, whatsoever. But um, you know there's a slippery slope, isn't there? And Addison's just doesn't appear overnight like that. So of course there's adrenal fatigue. It's very common, and my guess is that with ageing we all develop an element of adrenal fatigue and we could all be helped maybe by adrenal support of some description. So from a sciencey standpoint, one of the things that I spent some time taking a look at this and what's really going on, and I think it kind of ties into some of the things we've been saying before. One of the things is in acute stress, the adrenal gland can make its own cholesterol. For the listeners, cholesterol is like the base component of making all your hormones, and neurotransmitters. So we've got, we've got to get cholesterol production. We got either got to get it into the cell, into the adrenal gland to make it, or we got to be able to make it. So in acute stress, the adrenal gland has the ability to make its own cholesterol, but it's a limited amount that it can do that. In normal homeostatic low stress states or in chronic stress states, 
the adrenal gland relies on cholesterol coming from the bloodstream into the yeah. tissue. Now, if we go back to our good friend thyroid hormone, one of the things that helps get that cholesterol into the into the adrenal gland is the amount of thyroid hormone inside the, the adrenal cells because that helps with these shuttles to get it in. So for the lizard, we think about cholesterol, it's good, it's bad. It's not good or bad. Cholesterol is what it is. It, get, it gets oxidized, that's problematic. But these we got these little transport vehicles that are transporting stuff around. Cholesterol needs to get into the cell. When you've got this chronic, from my opinion, this chronic cell stress, we get this down regulation of metabolism, we have less thyroid hormone at the adrenal gland, I can't transport cholesterol into the tissues. I can't pull it into the liver well. I can't pull it into the adrenal gland. Well, that's why it stacks up in the bloodstream and creates more problem. But that's a problem for the adrenal gland because the adrenal gland in acute stress, big, big event, hey, I can make that on my own. But in chronic low-grade stress, which is what most of us are dealing with, I'm, I'm losing my ability to pull cholesterol out of the bloodstream and convert it. And as Sarah was saying, I also need optimal mitochondrial function to do that because that's where the conversion of cholesterol into progesterone, into these hormones, right. that's that kind of first step. I got to get it there to do a lot of that first step work. So I got to get it in. And we already talked about what happens when there's cell stress or cell danger or cell stiffening. It's harder to get those things into the cell. So the cell is deficient in some of the things it needs to transport it. From my perspective, I think there's calculated adaptive downregulation of thyroid hormone in the cell due to the part of that danger physiology. At some point in time, you get decreased total production and there's less hormone inside the cell. But that's one of the reasons that the adrenal gland isn't, whether fatigue sounds like it's broken, I think the issue is I, I, I'm just losing the capacity. I can't get the raw materials in to make it efficiently. And therefore I have less available. That's well, I mean, when I say fatigue, maybe I'm, we're talking about the clinical picture of IE. We're not, oh, yeah, yeah. Event, we can't produce the DHA. We can't produce the cortisol. Um, uh, but of course, nobody's going to do a biopsy of an adrenal gland to see what the mechanism of that is. Yeah. Um, but the clinical picture is, is of fatigue. But again, the treatment for that is not, uh, such a, a clear route as it is for the thyroid. I tend to start off using pregnenolone because um, that is the most upstream of the adrenal hormones. Um, maybe 25 to 100 milligrams would be a reasonable dose. It's inexpensive. You can buy it. Uh, maybe DHEA is useful. Uh, for some people, they need hydrocortisone. Um, and then others prefer to go down the herbal route. And the two useful herbs will be ashwagandha and ginseng. But as I say there's no well-prescribed path. It really is much more a case of suck it and see with the adrenals. With the thyroid, I always think it's a very, you know, fairly well-defined route to go down. Um, but with the adrenals, it's not so obvious. And as I say, it is much more a case of trial and error. And I think it kind of goes back to what we said before, right? You if you're just trying to manipulate the adrenals, but you're not addressing some of the root foundational issues. Of course, of course. If that's why we, and I do, and, and I'm so boring, but you know, that's why I call it groundhog regimes because I keep coming back to it over and over again. You start with the diet, the upper fermenting gut, then the nutritional supplements, then you sort the mitochondria, and then the thyroid and the adrenals. That's the um, that's the procession for when, for when you're looking at energy delivery mechanisms. Yeah, I I don't, I don't, I think we're all, we're on the same page here. I think what happens is we start at the other end often, yes. even in functional medicine, right? We see people starting with the T, oh, I'm just going to give you T3. I'm going to get this going. And I think it's like creating an addict because you can feel a little bit better and then well, the high is gone. Well, that's what I started off doing when I was getting interested in these things, because guess what? We all want to get the patient better tomorrow. And you know that by giving them you know, a hit of thyroid hormones, it's like an addiction. They will be better tomorrow. It's like giving them a shot of amphetamine or saying, go and eat a Mars bar. Yep, there'll be an immediate you know, result. And as a result of going down that route, I ended up with patients taking, well, I didn't, but I, had, I used to work with another doctor who on increasingly high dose of T3. I mean, I have one person coming to see me who's taking 180 micrograms a day of T3. Mm -hmm. Now I very, very, very rarely see that because I think that hormone receptor resistance issues start with diet, upper fermenting gut, and toxicity. And if you can sort that all out first, or at least put it all in place, 
then you and then I start the thyroid hormones and I start with very low doses and increase very slowly because um, I increase slowly because um um let's say one of the mechanisms by which thyroid hormones work is by increasing the number of mitochondria and mitochondria can't increase the numbers overnight it takes time and for them to increase their number they have to have the raw materials the freedom toxic stress and all that so we go very very slowly and it's very easy to miss that sweet spot because there is a there's a perfect dose and then you you and then you overdose and then you get reactions and if you go too quickly then you'll miss that sweet sweet spot and also bear in mind that the half life of T4 and T3 is quite long and therefore if you're giving the same dose every day and then you increase it you risk accumulative um uh, uh, reactions i.e. you get much higher levels than, than than you're expecting so so get everything in place first this is the essence of the book um and i've called it you know um the underactive thyroid do it yourself because your doctor won't which is the naughty title i know but it's absolutely true you have to do it yourself and again i emphasize in the book the importance of doing it in order getting in place the groundwork, which I call groundhog, and then very, very gently increasing the dose over weeks and months if necessary, so you don't miss that sweet spot. So in your time of doing this, what I'm seeing with my clients as I kind of work through this process is often they're over-medicated uh, because they're trying to Fix a number or try to low, if not, if this amount's not fixing the symptoms, more must. And then we get into the hypo hyper type symptomatology, right? And that's really gets frustrating. I think from an allopathic standpoint where the doctor says your TSH is 0.001, you have to be, you can't be hypothyroid. This has to be something else. And I'm like, no, they absolutely can be because you've saturated the hypothalamus. You essentially shut down the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. And so just look at your client. This this can happen because we have the tissue regulation. Go ahead. You brought up two, brought up two very important points there. Um, the first important point is the blood test. I just see is the coarse tuning and the clinical picture is the fine tuning. That's how we fine tune the dose of thyroid hormones. But your point about prescription drugs is very important as well because Prescription drugs come under the same category as pesticides and toxins. And what prescription drugs do is they work by inhibiting biochemical systems in the body. As I explained it, they increase the biochemical friction in the body. They make things work more slowly. But by contrast, using nutritional supplements, which might be oils, vitamins, minerals, whatever, they facilitate the biochemistry. They reduce the biochemical friction in the system and allow um, biochemistry to flow so mitochondria can, can function more easily. And whilst I'm on this point, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the work of Gerald Pollock, who talks about the fourth phase of water. Yeah. Um, uh, just to, just briefly, so listeners that are with us, we know water exists in three phases as a solid ice, as a liquid water and as a, as a, as a steam, as a gas, which we call steam. But Pollock's saying it exists in a fourth phase, which is what water does against the surface. Uh, now, he was doing experiments in glass containers, looking at what water does against the glass surface. But this is equally applicable to all cell membranes and all cells. Against the cell membrane, it aligns itself in a honeycomb structure. And if you tot up the electrons required for that honeycomb structure, uh, you find that it's, there, there are too many protons. So what that means is that honeycomb structure exudes protons. So all membranes are covered with this exclusion zone water or gel water, as it's called, which is negatively charged. Now, if you think about how things move in the body and uh, and how proteins are held in three dimensional shape, it's all about electricity. And if you don't have that quality water, that gel water, that exclusion zone water, then molecules are not held in the right three dimensional shape for uh, the most efficient form of biochemistry. And my guess is that many conditions uh, like a tendency to clot, for example, a tendency to inflammation are driven by an absence or a lack of this um, gel water, as it's called. Now, for that exclusion zone water to exist at all, you have to have an outside energy source, and that's infrared. Uh, you have to be warm. Muscles generate infrared. So unless you are warm, if you're less you're at the right body temperature, then all enzyme systems are going to go slow. And there are, my guess is that many drugs manifest by their effect by disrupting gel water. 
and um, uh, far infrared uh, heat from sunshine, from um, uh, saunas, whatever, is a, a very good way to improve gel water, as, as we call it, round membranes. And that's why far infrared so much improves um, mitochondrial function. That's why far infrared and heat is so good for immune function. So, um, uh, again, you can improve the improve um, the quality of our um, uh, cell membranes and, and the, the three-dimensional shape in which uh, these enzyme complexes are held with, with heat and keeping warm. Very, very, very important. And of course, there's an obvious vicious cycle here, because if you're underactive with the thyroid, you will run cold. And so if you're running cold, all enzyme systems are going to go slow because you don't have the gel water to allow things to, to flow and to function normally. Yeah. So somebody would jump, oh, well, that's why I want to give more thyroid hormone, right? So I can make it work. But again, it's not that simple, right? It's not about just put stuff in, going back to your car analogy, just because you put a higher higher test fuel into the car doesn't mean the car is going to run well, right? You could have bad spark plugs, bad fuel filter, whatever. And we have to do a better job of taking a bigger, broader picture of what's going on with somebody versus narrowing it down, which I think becomes part of the problem when we narrow the with the bo the body down to I'm only going to look at these two values versus looking at everything in a bigger picture then it makes Correct. it easier to treat but it's yeah. not it's not health it's not we're missing it. I, there's an old proverb. I don't even remember what it is, but it's like six blind men with an elephant, right? And they're all feeling different parts of the elephant and explaining what they see and they're all right. But they're all wrong. Right. Yeah, because there's yeah. the, the picture is too narrow. And I think we do that with a lot of different yeah. aspects of, of health and physiology. And we talk about these systems like they're unconnected. Well, that's a hormone issue. You got to go see the hormone specialist. That's a blood sugar issue. You got to go see the blood sugar person. Exactly. That that is that is the problem with conventional medicine. Um, and, and doctors are no allow, longer allowed to use their clinical acumen. Uh, and they become far too reliant on tests. And of course, tests makes management patient easy. Oh, uh, blood pressure's up, take this drug. Oh, blood sugar's up, take more metformin. Oh, blah, blah, blah. You know, so it makes for simple, mindless, protocol-driven medicine. And what we want is we want wise old women like me who have, you know, done it. <laughs> and wise old men like you. All right, there we go, there we go. <laughs> who have done it, have seen the clinical picture, know what works just from pure experience, and puts in place these very simple, what I call groundhog regimes, and put the patient back in charge of their disease. Because there is no person better motivated to get themselves well than the patient. And that patient once gets well, they are prepared to put the effort in, they observe symptoms and signs that occur from day to day, and attribute them to this intervention, that intervention, or the other. They are the people who are gonna get themselves well. And what I think medicine should be all about is, as I call it, giving people the rules of the game, and the tools of the trade so they can do it themselves. And I don't like doc I don't like patients getting addicted to me and addicted to tests. So we must get this test. Oh, that's not good. Let's do a micromanaging via test. It doesn't make for good medicine. I like them to learn about their disease, to gain insights from their own symptoms, their own signs, to put to give to empower them to put in place the necessary interventions so they can do it themselves. Because the fact of the matter is that there's not enough UMEs to go around. Correct. And and, that's and, why I and, like the books. Yeah, I mean, that's why I wrote mine as well, because we, hey, we got to change how we think about chronic illness and chronic disease. I use thyroid physiology as the window to talk about it, because I don't think everybody with thyroid physiology is broken. I think they're adaptive. They're trying to, to protect themselves. And you see and I see as we start to work on these foundational things, diet, lifestyle, emotions, respiration, sleep, all these qual things that are low hanging fruit, the foundations of health, instead of worrying about all the crazy wild things, how about we start with the foundational things? And when we do those, what I see is people need less and less thyroid medication yep. and where people are told, hey, a thyroid gland can't recover. I think that's nonsense. I see that happen with people. Hey, they're down to, they went from 100 micrograms of T4 to 12.5 micrograms of T4, right? How did that happen? Well, the thyroid gland must be recovering, right? The, if when the immune damage goes down, the thyroid gland has the ability to recover. I just just had a client who had a thyroidectomy, and they half their their lobe is back after two years of working together. How does that occur? The doctor's like, that should never have happened. How did that occur? Well, the body's got some great recuperative properties if 
the stressor goes away. People often say, but people need to take thyroid hormone forever. I'll get your opinion on this. My opinion is in a traditional model where you're managing biochemical numbers, yes, they're going to need thyroid hormone medication forever. Mm -hmm. But if we're truly doing functional medicine and we're looking at their health timeline, their health story, and we're looking at how did we get here and we're reducing that stress burden and stress load and we get them to a point where cell danger physiology turns to cell recovery and cell healing physiology, that person doesn't necessarily require a lifetime of medication. Matter of fact, what I've seen over 29 years is they need less and less and less, and some need none at all over time, which is, I think, really cool. So let me give it, let me get your opinion on that. Well, that that is the case for some, but my experience with with with, with people is that um uh you know we want we want to be stressed. We want to uh, be stressed by a dangerous sports or, or or whatever, or whatever. And to you know, and you know, I love stress. You know, I love the stress of being challenged. Like you know, chatting with you today has you know really made me think about what I'm saying. It's a pleasure, and to be able to rise up to that challenge, we do need those thyroid and adrenal hormones. So, you know, I hear what you're saying, and that is the case for some. But the majority of people I, I see, they get back to high stress jobs, they get back to burning the candle at both ends, and they need thyroid hormones to do that. And that's a lifestyle choice, if you like. You know, I could say to them, well, you could manage without thyroid hormones, but you can't do this, and you can't, you just have to live your whole life at a lower level. And guess what? They don't want to do that. Oh, I don't think we should avoid stress. I think when we're when we are in a healthier state. We can tolerate a lot of stress as long, yeah. but we need the recovery, right? So, but does that mean that somebody who's had a thyroid problem is going to require it? Well, it require medication for the rest of their life. Some may, depending on how much damage they have, but some may not need the same dosage. Some may need a lot less. Why? Yeah. Because they're not in danger, Philly. They're still in stress. We're all stress is never going to go away, nor should we try and be in a non-stress state. That's not a great place. To yeah. become stronger and more resilient, you need to stress your physiology emotionally, physically, chemically, all of those things. That's what makes us stronger. That's the whole conversation that I think steers some of these people. Uh, I love me, but the carnivore group was saying all plants are bad because they have stress or things that stress the immune system, stress the GI tract, but that's part of making the immune system stronger. That's the hormetic effect of stress. So we need it. So the answer isn't to never have stress. The stress, the answer is how do, can I take that stress, help it make me stronger, allow for the recovery so I can build and become stronger. The people that don't have stress, they're not resilient. The people that have stress and recover, they become more and more and more resilient. They can take that that COVID virus. They can take whatever infection. I had, oh, I, yeah, I've, I've given bitten tight ticks. I got the Lyme. Didn't have an impact. Not okay. even an issue, right? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to give you, I will give you kind of the last word, then we'll wrap, wrap this up a little bit and we'll let you get back to, back to life and tea. Oh, bless you. You're very kind. Um, and it, well, you know, my um, stand work, uh, happiest favorite phrase is keep it simple mm -hmm. because it's, it's very easy to give people shopping lists of things to do, but keep it very simple and very logical. And then people can suddenly think, do you know what? I can't, this is doable. Uh, it's very easy to overwhelm people <clears throat> with loads of biochemistry or supplements or expense or whatever, but keep it very simple. Um, and um, so that people really understand what's going on and teach them to do it themselves. That would be my overwhelming message. I see myself, you know, doctor comes from the Latin, to say it means to teach. Mm -hmm. And we should be teaching our patients to cure themselves. And yep, I can cheer from the sidelines and, you know, I can uh, be jolly in the background, but they have to walk the path. And, you know, when life gets difficult and there's you and I aren't there to hold their hand and cheer them, they've got to walk the path on their own. And if they realize that that's the deal, they will do very well. Yeah. I, I agree with, I agree with all of that stuff. I say we're like the Sherpa, right? I can guide you, but I can't, I can't climb Everest for you. Right. Correct. But I'll help you get there if you're willing to take, put the work in yeah. and get it done. But it is going to take work and the reward is is great, Correct. but it's going to put a lot of, you got to do it. I can't do it for you. And, yeah. we, and we need to give the people that want to 
put the work in an opportunity. And the people that don't want to work, put the work in, we just have to say, hey, look, there's another strategy over there, right? Do that. It's, it's not about health, but you can manage your condition for a while, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So Sarah, I want you to tell people, tell them about the name of the book, where they can get the book, oh. and then tell them about where they can hear more about you and your work. Bless you. Uh, the book is all called uh, The Underactive Thyroid. Do it yourself because your doctor won't. Um, you can get it from my website, Sales of Dr. My Hill. I also have a publisher in America called Chelsea Green, and they will be stocking the book um, uh, there. But I'm sure you'll be able to get it on Amazon anyway. Um, and uh, all you can get information about my work from my website, office, which is just drmyhill.co.uk. So if you just Google Dr. My Hill, it comes up. And if anybody wants to join me for a workshop day, I do online workshops where I talk all day and um, I limit it to 20 people and I talk about fatigue syndromes. And the deal is anybody can ask any question at any time. And I go through the Dutch regimes, the fermenting gut, the mitochondria in some detail so that the idea of that day is that anybody can join it can get the gist, can understand the basis of healthcare, and then I can give them, this, as I call it, the tools of the trade so they can fix themselves because that's the name of the game. Awesome. So I thank you for coming on the podcast. It was a great conversation. Hour and a half went by like it was nothing. <laughs> yes. We'll have to get you <laughs> back on the podcast because I think we only kind of scratched the surface of a couple chapters, but that's <laughs> the fun of these podcasts and the kind of the longer form we can get. We can kind of dig into some of these things and have kind of more enjoyable discussions about those things. So I appreciate you coming back on. I'll send your gang an invitation. Maybe in the next couple of months, we'll have you back on again and, and talk about something else that's in the book that we didn't get a chance to talk about. Okay. That'd be fantastic. Thank you for your time. You've been brilliant. All right. Thank you. Everybody be sure to share this episode of the podcast with your friends, your family. This isn't just about thyroid physiology. This is about overall health and wellness, which is really what Dr. Sarah's talking about, it's what I'm talking about. We're not talking about a condition. We use things like thyroid physiology to kind of talk through that lens, but this is all the foundational concepts that she talks about in her book. It doesn't matter what your health condition is. Those foundational concepts, the foundational concepts I talk in my book, they're pretty similar and they're all about the same things, but deal with the low hanging free stuff first right? That's the cheapest stuff. It's stuff you need to do to improve your health and well-being. Anyway, if you do more of that stuff and worry less about the, the all the other stuff, you're probably going to start to improve your health and well-being without much work and effort. All right. So thank you. We're going to wrap this up. Sarah, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was great having a conversation with you. My pleasure. Thank you for asking the great questions and making me think too. <laughs>